Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Jacopo Poli and I'm the lead of machine learning at Lighton. We are a company that uh, makes hardware for machine learning and since uh, one year now we are holding these uh, virtual meetups uh, where every month we invite uh, uh, researchers to present their uh, own research that we find interesting. And today we have a uh, Dr. Charles Martin, who is a chief scientist at Calculation Consulting, and he will talk about uh, Weight Watcher, a diagnostic tool for uh, deep neural networks. Um, and the show is yours, Charles, now. I'm going to stop the screen sharing, and you can start uh, your presentation when you want. Thanks. OK, great. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate being here. And I'm Charles Martin. I run a boutique consulting firm in San Francisco, California where we help client with strategy and implementation of AI. And I've been doing this for, oh wow, over 10 years now. I've worked with a lot of companies like eBay and BlackRock. I'm currently helping Walmart uh, with their search engine. So we do a lot of this work. What I'm gonna present to you today is some work I've done. Uh, it's, it's work I do on the side, which is research with uh, UC Berkeley into the uh, foundations of AI. And using that, we're able to um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe a tool to you that I've built. So just give me a second here to get the, um, I'm just trying to get the tool, the screen loaded. I'm having a little trouble with that. So I may have a little, things may look a little goofy on the screen. I'm gonna do a screen share. Um, where's the, where's the... Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes, but it's not okay. in a full screen. Right, I'm having a little trouble getting the full screen work. I, I, I seem to have opened the Adobe uh, Reader. It, it's still readable, so if you can't manage, I think it's still fine. Well, let me, I can try to make it a little, give me a second, I'll try to make it a little, I don't know why it's not in full screen. I'm having a little trouble with the tool, but um, if you can see it, I mean, that hopefully that's good enough. Okay. Uh, so yes, it, it, it's readable to me. So Okay, great. Sorry about that. I, I don't know why. I just have a little trouble with the tool. But um, this is, I'm going to talk about Weight Watcher. Weight Watcher is a diagnostic tool we've developed for analyzing deep neural networks. And again, this is done in joint with my uh, colleague, uh, Michael Mahoney, who's in the statistics department at UC Berkeley. Uh, this is an open source tool. It's just made in Python. It's a tool we've built to sort of describe some of the research we're doing. Um, you just, just Python tool, pip install Weight Watcher. Um, it's a research level tool. So if you were sort of the idea of giving the talks to try to convince people to use and introduce you to our research. So as an open source tool, it allows you to analyze and diagnose problems that occur in deep neural networks without needing access to training or even to test data. So it can be used to do a number of things. It can analyze various kinds of models like PyTorch and Keras and you know, we're always adding new formats and models. Uh, of, and so we're hoping, you know, if there's a particular format you want, let us know. It allows you to inspect models that are difficult to train. So it, the idea is you can inspect the model and try to figure out what's wrong. So you can gauge improvements in model performance. One of the things we've been able to show recently, and this is actually featured in a paper we have in Nature that's coming out this year, that we can predict the test accuracies across different models without access to test data. So given a series of models like VGG11, VGG13, VGG16, the tool will actually allow you to predict what the test accuracy would be, you know, the performance of the model without actually looking at the test data. And we also have found we're using it to detect potential problems. So for example, in our paper Nature, we describe um, a situation where we look at a, a, a model that was a compression model that was developed at Intel, and we show that when you compress or fine tune some of these models, you can introduce problems. And these are problems that are difficult to see if all you do is just look at the raw test error because you, you can't identify where the problem is coming from. So this, this work is based on theoretical research we're doing into why deep learning works. And the research uses ideas from random matrix theory, uh, from statistical mechanics, and from strongly correlated systems, which is really my background, which is um, quantum mechanics, quantum chemistry, uh, and strongly correlated systems. And again, it's a, it's a Python tool, pip install Weight Watcher. It's a very early stage. We don't even have a 1.0 release yet. So, you know, we're looking for adopters, people who might want to work with us in the tool, people want to try things out. Uh, just try it out and see how it works. 
So the I see if I can move forward. The idea is that Weight Watcher analyzes the shape and the scale of the correlation structure in each layer weight matrix. So given a neural network, we treat the neural network as a series of layers and we analyze the weight matrices in each layer. Um, sometimes the weight matrix is easy, like if it's a dense layer, it's fairly obvious. Uh, if it's a convolutional layer, then you have to slice it up into, into various slices. So we have to slice the layer up and there, is, there are different ways of doing that. But in the end, we end up with a series of, of matrices for each layer. And we analyze the weight matrices in each layer to tell you something about the model performance. And the, the key here is that typically in statistical learning theory, people simply look at the scale of the weight matrix, they look like a bound. So you might be doing like regularization and you're concerned with the scale. So if you were to look, for example, at this plot, this orange line here represents the largest eigenvalue of a particular matrix, um, it's the maximum. And that would be the scale. And that's the only thing that learning, that traditional learning theory looks at. In statistical mechanics though, you wouldn't just look at the scale, you would look at the volume of the, of the density, like a density of states. So what Weight Watch, and that, that would mean you, and then you look at the shape of the volume. So you look at the shape of this entire curve and in particular the shape of uh, the tail. And so what Weight Watcher does is it extracts plots and fits the spectral density of the eigenvalues for each layer weight matrix or tensor slice. This tail is where all the informative components are. This is where the information concentrates. And it's the shape of the tail that carries the most useful information for you about how your network is performing. And the shape being just, you know, say the, the slope of this line. So Weight Watcher has an algorithm and it will try to fit the slope of this line. And believe it or not, there, there are cases where this is actually kind of hard to do. Getting a really accurate fit and consistent fit is necessary. You know, we're not just doing a linear regression, we, but you know, it takes a little time. Um, this is an example of a bad fit. The purple line is a bad fit and the red line is a good fit. And the idea is if you get a good representation of this shape, then you can actually tell something quite, you can actually tell a lot about what's going on. And so the tool is just, impl it implements a variety of, of algorithms which help you to, to fit the shape. And we use both uh, uh, as a heavy tailed distribution and sometimes using the ideas from random matrix theory. I won't go into too much of that today, but a little bit. This is how the tool works. It's meant to be very simple. I'm trying to keep the friction as low as possible. You just create the tool, you, you know, you import it. You say uh, watcher equals weight watcher and you give it the model. So this might be some pre-trained model from Keras or PyTorch. It might be the model you run after every epoch. So every after every epoch you train your model, you can pass them the Weight Watcher and you can generate a plot. And, and we're used to working with models that are very, very big. This is for production systems. So you know things like GPT, which have thousands of layers. And so we expect the, the training is much, much slower than this. So we, you pass in the Weight Watcher, you get a plot, and I'll show you some of the plots. Or, and, you get a, and you get a detailed data frame. And the data frame just contains various metrics. And these are metrics which tell you something about your performance. And in particular, this metric here, this alpha metric, is the one that is, is the shape of your uh, spectral density. But there are other things as well. And you also can get a, a summary statistic, which is just a simple layer average. And these statistics are used to tell, give you a performance measure of what's going on in your model. There, there are other things we can do as well. I'll describe, but this is sort of the basics of what's going on. So an example would be, um, let's make it stay. let me do, show you an example. We do layer by layer analysis. So for example, we've looked at some of the GPT models that are coming out of uh, OpenAI and other places. These are sort of the original models. In fact, I, I had a client a few years ago. I helped them write a tool called Kafka AI um, they're actually in Slovenia, and there was a tool which generates fake text. This actually predates GPT. So we've been doing this sort of auto-generation of text for a long time. And in this case, you look at GPT, you may recall when they first released GPT, there was this scare that GPT would be used to do all sorts of horrible things and generate all sorts of fake news. So they released a really poor version of it. It was the model that was trained on, on really poor data. And then later, they decided to release GPT-2, which is this model, which is trained on better data. Now there's GPT-3, which they're selling access to, and there are people trying to reverse engineer it. And, but this is sort of the original version. This is, um, uh, this, I think this is actually discussed in the Nature paper. 
In GPT, you can see if I plot on the X axis, this is the alpha, I don't have it labeled, but it's alpha. This is our performance metric. And this is just a histogram. You can see in GPT-2, you get these, You for the most part, alpha concentrates around four, but there are all these large spikes, they occur nine, you know, around 12, maybe 13. And, and this is characteristic of a model that's not performing very well. And again, we're not looking at the test data. We don't, we don't have any test data for GPT because it, it's a model for generating text. Like we, we don't have access to training data. Um, it, it's enormous. Now, if you then take the exact same model uh, and you train it with better data, which is GPT-2, the blue, and you look at the alphas, you see something very interesting. You see that the alpha, on average, the alpha concentrates now around three and a half. So it gets smaller which is typical of these models. And you see these large outliers all go away. So this is a good example of, of exactly how the performance metric works by studying your weight matrices, looking at their shape and lo looking at the scale as well and characterizing it. You can actually tell how well your model is going to perform without actually looking at any kind of um, test accuracy. And, and of course, in models like GPT, I mean, these are models that are designed to predict text. So it's not like you have a classification error. So th this is an example of how the tool is used. Here's another example of layer by layer analysis. This is one which we did after having a discussion with Intel. And we realized that they have these models which allow them to compress the uh, algorithms which compress models that because they want to run on their hardware. That's a very common thing to do. And one of the particular ones we found was called the um, group regularization technique from the in Intel distiller package. And we just started looking at some of the models that were compressing. We discovered there was an anomaly in one of them. So if you consider the baseline model, sort of your large model, that's green. And in red, you fine tune it. So you compress it because you want to put your model on a device. And then you look at the scale. We found that there were scale anomalies, that if you were to plot the maximum eigenvalue for each layer, and you do this sort of layer by layer analysis, and again, Weight Watcher will help you do this, you find that the pre-trained model has the, the, the certain layers where the scale is quite small, and that, that's typically um, uh, thought to be good, although we can talk about wh what's going on there. And then when you, when you fine tune it, the scale blows up. And this is very curious. Um, you know, you, you wouldn't, ex you know, it's kind of strange that that would happen. You would expect that when you fine tune your models that the scale won't change, but it indicates a lot of people when they're training their models, they don't bother to look at these this fine level of detail. And it's not really clear what the constraints should be because it's not obvious whether you could be, should be constraining the scale and how. And so we found that there are a number of these sort of anomalies that appear in models like a compressed ResNet model that, you really, we, we're advocating you go and look at and try to understand how the scale and the shape performs, especially in things like when you're fine tuning. So here's an example of uh, how you can use the model to actually predict test accuracies. We, we have, have a number of uh, papers like this. This is a recent paper we submitted to NURIPS, NIPS um, just a few days ago where we discussed this. There was a contest out of NURIPS where they wanted to predict generalization. It, it's actually kind of a funny story. We submitted the, our, our um, NIPS paper, to, their nature paper to NIPS. They rejected it because it was too empirical. And then they had a, and then they launched a contest, to, you know, to do the exact same thing, which was described in our paper. So we took their data and said, let's take a look at what they're doing. And they're doing some really funny things in this contest. And we, we talk about this, but one of the things we discovered is that if you take their contest data, and we, we just ignore the training data because we don't, we're not gonna use the training data for this. And we just look at our alpha, our average alpha. So we just take our alpha metric, the layer alpha, and we just take a naive average. Um, they have various models that they've trained at different layers. They have two, uh, two layers with 10 layers. The two, the 10, the six X represent models with a different number of layers. Not necessarily two layers, it's just their notation. And we found that they, and, and what they're doing here is varying the hyperparameters different kinds of hyperparameters such as batch size, weight decay, momentum. They're varying these parameters, retraining these models. So we're taking somebody else's models that they've trained and they've produced various levels of performance. So some of them, are, they're all basically the same architecture, but some of them have very good test performance, you know, up to 95% test performance. And some of them do very poorly, like 75% test performance. And we found as long as you have the same number of layers, 
you can just look at your alpha. And the alpha correlates remarkably well with the test accuracy across different models. And, and so we found this and we have a paper where we discuss, for example, that alpha actually correlates correctly. But if you look at the spectral norm from statistical learning theory, it's actually anti-correlated. The spectral norm has the exact opposite behavior as predicted by theory when you vary hyperparameters. So our, our theory works perfectly uh, when you vary various kinds of hyperparameters. Again, we're varying the hyperparameters and trying to predict trends in the test accuracy just by plotting alpha without looking at the test data or the training data. And this works remarkably well, and it works for models that are very well trained, models that are less poor, that are poorer trained. It doesn't work as well, but, and, and we know why, because the model isn't trained as well. So when the models are not trained well, you don't capture the correlations well and use these sort of funny results. And so we have a number of results like this where you can use the tool for doing this. We also have a multi-purpose metric. So we describe in the, our paper that, you know, if you want to adjust for layer size, we have this thing called a alpha hat. And I have a general theory we've been working, which comes from um, quantum statistical mechanics, uh, actually quantum field theory. So my addition quantum field theory, it's a matrix generalization of the student teacher model of statistical mechanics where we can derive this metric. But you can see if you vary both hyperparameters and the architecture, you get a, a fairly good prediction again, with alpha hat versus test accuracy across a number of different model architectures. And we have tested this now on hundreds of models. And we always see pretty good consistent performance, again, without access to test or training data. Now, some of the, the uh, just we're getting ready to, I think we're almost ready to close, but I'll just sort of comment. Some of the things we're looking at now in terms of research update, we've discovered that we believe that when the alpha drops below two, that your layers may be overtrained. And so we had this idea, maybe we can use alpha as a stopping metric. So we, uh, there's uh, another fellow, Xander Dunn, who decided to give this a try. Um, he's another independent researcher and he was training a transformer model. And you can plot here as the training error decreases at some point, the, te the test error, the validation loss started to saturate and increase. So at this blue line right here demonstrates when the model starts to be overtrained. And amazingly, as soon as the model started to be overtrained, it's exactly where alpha crosses to. I, that was remarkable. It was predicted by theory. Uh, it just worked right out of the box for him. I was really surprised. So we're investigating this to see if it's consistent, uh, but it's pretty interesting. Um, and, and there are a number of other things as well, other areas of research we're looking at is trying to understand the difference between when heavy elements appear in W and when heavy elements appear in X. And th this, this whole idea that what gives rise to heavy tails. And this has been an argument in physics that's going back to the 90s, you know, is are heavy tails a result of just multiplicative random processes or are they indicative of the correlation structure in a system? And does it mean something like you're near a critical point? And so we, the tool will actually help you do this. And uh, Mike has a nice paper coming out on this on the, on the sort of the con side that the W just arises from multiplicative noise. And, you know, me being a physicist, I would argue, oh, the, 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 the heavy tails arise from the correlation structure. And what you can do is alpha is you can compare the randomized W matrix uh, to your X matrices. And we can describe when cases when you, when W is randomized and you compare sort of this green plot to the red plot, when the green and red plots look very different, we suspect the models are doing quite well. And when these green and red plots look the same and they have these funny spikes, we think your models might be overfit. And we think we can detect this again, simply by looking at the weight matrices. So this is a presentation of the, the tool and a, a sort of a highlights of the research that we're doing. And I'll uh, stop here and see if anyone has any questions. Thanks a lot for the presentation. It's uh, really, really interesting. Um, if anyone has any question, now is the time. You can either unmute yourself and ask them directly or uh, write them in the chats and I will ask them for, uh, for you. So any questions? Yeah, um, yes, I've got a question. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, Go ahead, Igor. Uh, thanks, Robin. Uh, uh, Charles, um, in one of the last slides, um, I'm not quite sure I understood exactly what your um, uh, graph was uh, showing. Um, can you go back down a bit? Which slide? Uh, no, before and before. And before, uh, once again. Yeah, this one. Okay. Um, so so 
it looks like you're computing the average alpha on different architectures. Uh, each one of yes. them are essentially the 6x, 9x, and, and so forth. Okay, so now I think I'm getting it. So let's say, for instance, the, um, the one at the bottom, this uh, 6xx is basically a certain type of uh, architecture. And anytime you have, you're computing the average alpha, you can see that the slope of each of these uh, uh, straight lines is actually going down. And that's basically the, the point you're making, right? Yes, yes. As alpha gets larger, the test accuracy gets worse. Okay. And so what is this um, uh, black line? Uh, that Sorry, the black line is, I, I pulled this out of one of our papers. The black line is, is the total. So it's, it's everything. I so it's, it's saying that alpha doesn't necessarily, I, I didn't, I should have removed that from the plot. Uh, it's it, in our paper, we talk about a Simpsons paradox. So we point out that if you try to create the, the, the goal of their contest was to create a general purpose metric that works for all architectures and all hyperparameters. Okay. And in, in the paper, then in, in this contest, they have this goofy causal metric that they come up with. And we, we try to be very polite in the paper and say, that's the causal metric is totally wrong. And, and the reason you, for doing causal, if you want to do causal analysis, you, the problem with trying to come up with any general purpose metric is that you can have a Simpsons paradox, meaning that depending on which parameters you change, you can see different behaviors. So in this case, when you vary the hyperparameters, you see that we have very good uh, correlation with test accuracy. But if you vary all the parameters, then you see that alpha is anti-correlated. And so this is an example of a Simpsons paradox, where if you if you look at all the various changes, alpha it looks like alpha isn't working. But if you hold the, it's not even the architecture, just the number of layers. If you hold the number of layers fixed, yeah. and vary everything else, then alpha works perfectly. I see. Okay. That's and, the and Simpsons paradox that you're talking about. Okay, yes. Great. And then we show cool. the exact same, and we don't have it here. The exact same thing happens at a much stronger level with um the spectral norm so if you vary the spectral norm you actually if you vary the number of layers the spectral norm behaves correctly and it it, it correlates with tech accuracy but if you hold the number of layers fixed and you vary the hyperparameters the spectral norm is anti-correlated so you get a plot like this for the spectral norm but all the you know everything goes you know everything goes a different direction and, and, and so yeah and so the question uh comes up that i mean it's very difficult i think uh, uh, looking at the, the four or five papers that you, you and Mike uh, have been writing, uh, I've been following your work and everything, uh, it's kind of already difficult to figure out a metric that kind of fits these, uh, uh, all these findings and everything. Um, well, this is, the, this is our metric, alpha hat. Uh, exactly. And so my question, uh, well, that's the latest one because initially we're not at, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The best thing is you just ask us because you know writing it take this 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 work like the alpha hat. Some of this is like two, almost three years old by now. Yeah, it I know, takes I know. so long to get things published. So just ask us. You know, I'll, tell, I'll explain. It. No, yeah, go ahead. So the alpha but, hat seems to work. Yeah, the alpha hat uh, seems to work, but you seem to also. I mean, it's kind of new to me. This uh, Simpson paradox. That is, uh, mm. how do you go about uh, figuring out that this this one parameter needs to essentially stay constant? To essentially figure out that that matrix is is correlated or anti-correlated, what's your point of view on this? Well, I have sort of a hand wavy point of view. The the hand wavy point of view is that um, think about back in, in statistical mechanics, there are extensive and intensive variables. So in in some sense, the spectral norm and these things that depend on the size or the scale of the entire system are in a sense extensive. Um, and alpha is more like an intensive variable. So when you vary just parameters of the system, for example, just parameters of the hyper, just the solver, parameters of the solver itself, as opposed to the architecture, then alpha is very well correlated. And, and that's sort of like the hand wavy argument that the, the idea that we're looking at a thermodynamic response function. So alpha, the shape of the density is like a thermodynamic response function. And you would expect that object to, to work well when you're varying an intensive variable. And, and the alpha hat is kind of like P delta V, you know, in thermodynamics where you have an, an intensive variable times an extensive variable. 
So that's kind of my hand wavy intuition around it. The, you know, we, we just sort of found empirically, I mean, I've been studying these things empirically for several years now, and I realized that w- what's happening in, in a sense is that when I first derived the expression for alpha hat, I realized I have to adjust for the scale of the system that alpha, because alpha is scale invariant. Alpha is a scale invariant metric. And when the scale of the system is changing, you had to adjust for it because I just didn't get the right results. They were just bananas. Um, and I, I and it just, I sort of figured out alpha hat first kind of, I joke with Mike, it's kind of like when Bohr figured out the Bohr model. You know, he didn't know what he was doing. He was just fitting stuff. And he goes, I, yeah, you know, he goes that, that's, that's a little pretentious. Uh, but that's, I just, you know, the theory came later. Like the idea, like, I mean, you know, I sort of knew about the theory because I knew about Bouchard's work. And uh, I knew that you could do this kind of stuff, but um, we sort of did all the experiments first. So we, we kind of have the theory in the back of our mind, but that, that's how we look at it. And in fact, if you go back to the old literature in NIPS of all places, before when it was called NIPS in the 90s, there are some papers where people talk about looking at the thermodynamic response function of neural networks, you know, but they're looking at the, instead of looking at the data, they look at the data dependent one. So they'll look at things like, the activations versus the training data. And that's where I first started in this. Like, that's just too hard. That object is enormous. Um, I need a data independent response function. And so that that's sort of the, the hand wavy of, of what we're doing here. Um, okay, thank you very much, Charles. I, yeah, I'm yeah, gonna, sure, sure. Everyone ask, ask those questions again. No, but if ask, you know, whatever, if I can, I, there, uh, if I can think of another, um, you know, we talk about it in our Simpsons paper, we do talk about why we think the, uh, why the scale metric is, is you know, we, we talk in some detail, the relationship between the scale metric and alpha. And I can send you a preprint of it. We, we go into great detail, a little bit of detail about that. You know, we, we're limited in the NIPS, you know, we only have 10 pages. So we end up writing these 50 page papers and we still you know, have to shove them down to like a 10 page paper to get them into the conference. And so you miss lots of details. So, but I, I appreciate the questions. Thanks for the answer. And uh, we have two, two questions in the chat. The first one is uh, by Mayank uh, asking if uh, this is uh, valid and specific only if there is some uh, specific initialization applied to the layers or if it's uh, general with any we have We have no idea because we, we, don't, we haven't trained any of the models that we look at. Um, so that's one of the things we've tried to do is avoid training our own models. So the VGG models are things which um, we, you know, we've looked at hundreds of pre-trained models and we assume that they're all just, you, you know, we sort of, the models we train, we use the, we just use the standard Xavier initialization, you know, a Gaussian random matrix where the tails are, are cut off. Um, we have no idea if someone has some other odd or, you know, specific normalization and if it would change the results. Uh, you know, we've, we've, you know, if you look, for example, in this contest models, you know, they, we don't actually know how they train them. Um, we, we just have access to the models themselves and the data. So we, we do know, for example, there are models that perform poorly and models that perform well. And we know that alpha works better. We know that the theory works better on models that perform better. That that's, and we know why, because you get better fits to alpha, uh, but we don't know about initialization. Yeah, I'd say that since you've tried the metric on models that range from VGG to GPT, you have a pretty nice sampling of different initializations. So, um, okay, we have other two questions. One from Ruben, uh, he's asking, for computing a theoretical alpha, what assumptions do you make on the weight matrix? Like in terms of distribution, if it's uh, Gaussian or... Uh, None, none. We just try to ignore all I, we, we have no, no assumptions. I just take the weight matrix and I compute its eigenvalues. Um, the, so, you know, we, it's, uh, so, so the alpha is just empirical, right? There is no it's theoretical. Empirical. There's no, there's no, we, we just assume uh, it's a weight matrix. I mean, it has to be real. Re, re, okay. It has to be a real matrix. It, we don't, I mean, in principle, I guess it'd be complex, but we, we it has to be real. And with the convolutional layers, um, you know, we have different tech, you're different, you know, you can't, it's not obvious how to extract a matrix out of a convolutional layer. So we, we, you know, the only assumption we really make is that they're large, that they're large mm-hmm. enough that we can get the eigenvalues out. And 
Um, we don't make any broad assumptions beyond that. Okay, and so you compare it with the Marchenko Pasteur distribution? Uh, we do that as well. That's actually hard to do at scale with hundreds of models. It turns out there are cases where we do that. Uh, we described that in, our, in, a, in a GMLR paper. Um, generally, what we find, the general result is that the reason it's hard to do is because no matter what you do to try to fit you, you know, because you have to fit the scale before you, you know, alpha scale invariant. So I don't have to rescale the weight matrix. Marchenko pressure is not scale invariant. Marchenko pressure depends on the scale. And you might think, oh, that's trivial. Just rescale it. Well, you know, for, you know, if you look at these models, if you look at like different models, it turns out that sometimes the weight matrix scale is screwed up, you know, like in this, um, like, or is the, like in this example, the, for whatever reason, the weight matrix scale gets screwed up. And so if you look at actual production models, it's the tool will actually fit, it will actually do the random Marchinko pressure fits, but every once in a while it screws up because the scale is off. Uh, generally what mm. we find is that the production level models don't fit Marchinko pressure very well. You can always fit it, but it's not a great fit. And we find that The, in fact, this is one that's even we, it's in the paper. We find the quality of the alpha fit is sometimes actually correlated with the test accuracy, independent of alpha. So the better the power law fit is, the better your models can perform. We find that in about half the cases. The Marchinko pasture fits when you have a random matrix. I'll show you an example here. When you do this red, when you, if you randomize the W matrix, Usually you find that it fits Marchenko Pasteur pretty well. Sometimes there are spikes that appear outside of the, of the edge. They actually, they can appear outside both edges, both the left and the right edge. Um, the, and so in this case, when you randomize W, this red plot is, is perfectly Marchenko Pasteur. It's just on a log scale. This plot, if you, if you randomize W in this case, this is not, this is not Marchenko Pasteur. Um, It, it might be, it's actually, it's a little bit Marchenko pasture. Excuse me, excuse me. It is Marchenko pasture, but it has these spikes on the outside. So these are, these are different aspect ratios. These matrices have different aspect ratios. But this, but you see, you also get these, this sort of bleeding out. So you'll get sort of outside both the left and the right edge. But X is generally not Marchenko pasture. And when it is, it, it's, it's generally a pretty bad fit. At least for, okay. for most of the production models we've looked at. If you look at small models like Lynette 5, actually X is, is Marchenko pasture with a few spikes. Uh, okay. Okay, I see. And uh, last question. Um, have you tried to look at the weights of uh, adversarially trained neural network to see if there is a different behavior than the one that are naturally trained? I, I think Mike has done this. He may have a postdoc or a student who's tried to do it. Um, I know that's something he, he's done a lot of work in adversarial training. Um, I don't know what the results are. I, I know he has some student or postdoc doing, you know, with the, with the pandemic, you know, they're all, all the students are working at home. So I'm not sure what they're doing, but I think they are looking at it. I don't think they've seen anything that's, um, uh, I, I haven't heard any, any feedback of what they've really seen of anything that's of any great interest. Okay, But if I, I can, I, if you ask me again, I'll, I'll actually ask him next time I talk to him uh, and see if, you know, if he has a response on that. I don't recall anything that was particularly interesting. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Next question. Does the variance of alpha heads over the layers tell us anything? I'm not sure. Uh, we haven't looked strongly at the variance across different layers. We have sort of these plots. Uh, like this, where we, we have alpha as well. Um, I mean, I think here, this is probably the only plot where you see the variance of the alpha. Um, we, haven't looked in we haven't looked in detail to see anything about it. And what we know is that the outliers tell you something, that when the outliers are large, there's something wrong with the training of the layer. And, and we have some, ex we go into some detail of that in the next paper of, of what's going on, but I'm not sure about the variance. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, related to this, actually, I have a question. Have you tried, uh, sure. for example, uh, adjusting the learning rate per layer by looking at the alpha per layer or something like that? We we have someone who we have a we have a Slack channel. We have people who use the tool, and there is a fellow 
um, uh, Matt Johnson, who actually helped us out with some of the causal analysis, who is doing something like this. He, he works for a company where they're trying to adjust, uh, they're trying to detect, um, they're doing OCR and receipts. And he has certain layers and he's trying to fine tune VGG and he has to adjust the layers. And they do do things like adjust alpha. We look at alpha um, to try to figure it out. Um, I haven't talked to him recently. He's been on vacation, but this is exactly the kind of stuff he's doing. Um, and so we have suggested to people to try adjusting the learning rates in different ways to see if you can and fix it. You know, look at alpha, look at the spectral norm. You, you even can look at even simpler, the distance between um, your, you, you look at the Frobenius norm of the distance between W and W initialization. So there are a number of, there are several different metrics you can look at when trying to train layer by layer. I myself personally haven't tried it. We, we do know that when you, when you, um, yeah, I, I won't go into that. You know, we, we haven't personally, haven't tried doing that. I'm just, I'm not deeply involved in training these kinds of problems. Like in my, in my, in, in my commercial work with clients, it's much more um, just trying to get things into production. So we don't do a lot of, uh, I haven't worked a lot in this sort of OCR type problems where you're really trying to fine tune individual layers, but we have people who have tried, you know, we suggested it. Okay, then that's interesting things. Uh, we have another- In fact, we, we have, yeah. I'll, I'll even add a comment. We have this sort of conjecture that some layer, I mean, this is sort of the way I, we sort of things we're trying to look at now in the research. Some layers can be overtrained, some layers can be undertrained, and some layers are just right. I sort of call it like a Goldilocks issue. And so we have, uh, and, and so we do have this notion that, you know, you, that's the idea is that you want to adjust the learning rate per layer to try to get good alphas on all of them. That, that is something that we think um, is the right thing to do. Yeah, that, that's also what intuitively, I, I, I think uh -huh. when I see this plot, <laughs> it's pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously it, it would be nice to do it, you know, adaptively, but, you know, I'm, I'm doing yeah. all this in my spare time. So I just haven't had time yeah. to, uh, to do this, yeah. Thanks. Uh, question from the chat. So the, the, they ask if the confirmation, so in the end, the calculation of the alpha coefficients depend only on the weight matrices. So it's totally task independent. When you have a yes. model, you just compute alpha and that's it. Yes. You only need the model. Yes. Great. Um, are there any other questions? Otherwise I have a last one. Go ahead. Um, so one thing, uh, because I've read uh, like the full series of your paper, which is uh, <laughs> like a, a lot of work actually. Uh, if I recall correctly, like in the first one, probably you were um, like one of the uh, rough assumptions you made was that uh, when you train with the like, stochastic gradient descent and back propagation, there are some like implicit, implicit regularization mechanism that right, right. do so that the training like, behaves in a certain way and then you show the like the five plus one phases and right right that was one of our first papers right and that, that, that was like finally it's getting published we wrote that yeah. like four years ago <laughs> yes I, I can load that up keep talking i'll see if i can find it actually keep, keep going. And, and i was wondering um because like now one of the interests that we have actually at layton is um we think that when you want to train and scale to like very, very large models like GPT-3, actually training with uh, backpropagation is not that great because you have a lot of communication costs. So you, you would actually want to do something else like different training method that is more local or something like that. And do you think that changing from uh, like backpropagation end-to-end to something that is uh, a bit different would change what we see because well let, let me let me give a sort of my again it's sort of a, a hand wavy argument on this um uh, you know i uh the the idea of the this is this this plot that you're talking about this phenomenon we call it the five phases of training and this is sort of our our what we did here is we were we were actually adjusting the batch size and we found that you adjust the batch size and you can make the thing you can start with a, a random initialized matrix and make it go through any phase you want you can even overtrain it. You can force it into rank collapse just, just by tweaking the back size. Um, the, the idea of the implicit regularization is this idea that as you, as you, you know, what backprop is doing, it's even not so much SGD, it's backprop. You know, as you're looping over the data over and over and over. And every time you look at the data, um, you've, 
change the optimization. This is sort of my argument. This actually might actually go into this answer for Igor because I uh, sort of when I first thinking about this, every, every time you loop over the data after every epoch, you've changed the optimization landscape. So typically when people think about optimization problems, they think about there's some there's some in, you know, in dimensional landscape. It's probably, uh, you know, it's highly non-convex and you're trying to jump around and find, you know, the, the local minima or some global minima, depending on your solver. And I sort of think of this more like in protein fold, like a protein folding type landscape where that's sort of like some of the analogy where this came from. But the idea that every time you do a, a, a passive backprop, You've changed the optimization landscape. And by that, I mean that if the optimization landscape is simply defined by the weights and biases, because those are the things that you're varying when you, you know, when you're not, you know, the, the, that's the, the, even though you may tune hyperparameters and you may adjust the batch size and you may do it layer by layer and you could do it on every epoch, it, you know, during each epoch, the only thing you're varying are the weights and biases. So you're, that's the optimization landscape. I, and I call it sometimes the energy landscape. And after every epoch, the energy landscape changes. So if, if you think of it as you, you have a series of energy landscapes that, are, that start off very, very flat with lots and lots of local, lots and lots of degenerate minima. And that's sort of the random matrix. And it's maximal entropy. It's a maximal entropy type of landscape because there's lots and lots of, of minima. In fact, it, it's sort of my first thing, but it's almost like a spin glass landscape. Um, because you have just you have all these degenerate minima, and then as you as you pass over backprop each time you do a, a, an epoch, that landscape becomes more and more ruggedly convex. And as you get toward the end of training, the landscape, if you look, if you, instead of squinting at, if you, instead of squinting at, you look at it sort of on a global scale, you would expect the landscape to be globally convex and locally non-convex. And, and that's the idea of implicit regularization, that it's actually, and, and why does alpha work is because alpha only depends on the solver hyperparameters. It doesn't depend on the architecture itself. So if you change the architecture, you've changed the global landscape. Uh, and so you have, you're, 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 in a, you're studying a different problem. Uh, but as long as the architecture itself is the same and all you're doing is changing the regularization hyperparameters, you're just sort of changing the way that landscape is being modified. So how, what does that have to do with your question? Well, that, that's what we think of as implicit regularization. And obviously, you know, we can't publish that because that's all like sort of hand wavy chemical physics kind of stuff. And you, it's difficult to publish something like that in the machine learning literature. Uh, but that's sort of the, the idea. Um, and it sort of comes from protein folding research, which I, you know, I worked on with my, you know, my advisor, of course, worked on, you guys don't, maybe don't know that my advisor was the one who developed, um, uh, him and his student are the ones who developed uh, alpha fold. So what, so if you change the way you train, I, I would say you still have to get to this point where you have a problem, which is at, you, is at some point globally convex even though locally it's non-convex. And, and I think that is sort of the idea that if you, if you try to just treat learning as just, a, uh, just an optimization problem, I, I'm not sure you would end up with the kind of results that you see using backprop. Yeah, I see. I think that that's an interesting perspective because like, I interpret this as a, a, one of the issues with the alternative training method is that usually there are, uh, hard to evaluate because like back propagation, we have uh, uh, decades of trained models that we know work. And right. uh, you can't do the same effort in one paper for a new method. But the way I see it is that if we interpret uh, these five phases uh, plus one of training, like you said, then it means that if we can show that we can somehow exhibit these phases of training by varying something, then we're like on a good uh, on a good path to to something that actually works, which is really interesting. I think I, I even have a blog. This is the first blog post I wrote. This blog post because years ago, this is how I got involved with Mike. 
I read this paper by Lee Kun. We were talking about, you know, the spin glass representation of models. I read them like, this is just complete nonsense. Uh, and I, my, my advisor worked with Edwards who invented spin glasses. So I, and I remember, you know, and I read this paper like this is nonsense. And this is this is like a, a, pic, a picture of sort of what I was trying to describe where you have in protein folding, these old models from the 90s in protein folding, where you have, this is sort of a traditional optimization landscape, which is in red. And that would be governed by random matrix theory. That's why that would be um, in protein folding. That's the like the molten globular state because it, it has all this all these degenerate minima, and then the folded states usually look something like this. They're, they're globally convex or almost or you know maybe semi convex, but locally you know so the you know, imagine there's sort of this envelope around here which is convex, and then you have these local minima, and and sort of the the in fact in the old days. Um, Way back in the 90s, and when people were doing this, uh, when I, I was at Urbana um, in theoretical physics, people who were doing protein folding used to think of neural networks as proteins. Like, or excuse me, they thought of proteins as neural networks. Like they, they were they were the same people doing protein folding were doing neural network theory. And it was this idea that the protein is able to learn the folded structure. So the idea of how does a neural network learn was thought to be, there was a sort of analogy it would learn the same way evolution teaches a protein to learn the folded structure. And, and so, um, well, unfortunately, I don't have that picture. So anyway, that, and, and so this whole idea of why does the, what do the phases of training mean? Th this idea actually was, came from a, uh, an idea by Wolnis, um, an owner cheek, an owner cheek was a student of Popfield who had this idea called a generalized random energy model where you have this sort of rant, this March, imagine like a Marchinko Pasteur distribution, and then there's a spike outside. And uh, this model was used, this is Wolny's spin glass model, random energy model, or the generalized sort of spin, um, generalized random energy model was you would have this spike, which is where all the correlations concentrate. And this, this picture, which we see in, um, the, the, the rise of these five phases of training are exactly analogous if you flip it to these old models of protein folding. And that spike corresponds to this, essentially this low energy conformation of the protein, which we believe, uh, which in our case corresponds to the components of the neural network, which cause the system to generalize. So that's exactly the kind. Of, in fact, we have we have other work. We have I even talk about it where, if you do, um, you can actually predict the test accuracy fairly well, if you if you have the training data. If you take a low rank approximation of each of the weight matrices, meaning that you just keep these spikes and you keep the eigenvectors representing these spikes. This is where the information concentrates. So I, I think that any model that. Uh, and by, by the way, there's also this guy, and there's people who actually have have have, have shown. Later, after you know, I conjectured this in like 2015, and then there's a nice fellow who has um, has all this this fantastic graphical image where he shows that like when you add residual connections, the energy landscape actually does transform into these funneled landscapes. So this turns out to be like if you um, this is a guy named Xavier who has done this, and he showed like you can see it visually. Like when you add residual connections, you go from this flat surface in the lost landscape to this, this funneled surface. So I think you would have to have the same thing. Um, you know, we, we observe the funneling through this sort of looking at the weight matrices, but you can also just look at the lost surface directly. But you, you have to have this, this implicit regularization, meaning this convexification of the lost dynamics or the lost surface really, I think in order to get learning. Thanks, thanks for the answer. Sure. Really, really clear and detailed. Uh, one last question from the chat. Um, are there some Bayesian priors that can be trained with some kernels or are there any relationship with the neural tangent kernels and similar methods? I, I have an idea about this, but it's not very well flushed out. Um, and you know, the, the neural tangent is a situation where you're taking the limit as n goes to infinity, but you're assuming an infinitely wide network. And we, we sort of have this um, halfway baked theory. It's also on my blog. And, I, and it's, I, I don't know if I'll ever get this published. It'll take us years to, uh, but I have this sort of halfway baked theory from statistical mechanics where 
which, which we're just, how do I share, share screen? Where we look at, this is a matrix generalization of the student teacher model statistical mechanics. And what you end up with, with is something where you write down the energy expression for the neural network looks like this object, which is called an HCIZ integral. So, it, and this object is actually similar to what you might do a type of, it's kind of like a Bayesian model uh, of, the, of the error. And this is an expression where you take, you take the limit of n goes to infinity. So you have this sort of an expression where you have an infinitely wide network. And, and we think what happens is that uh, in this situation, and I, I, you can go through like in, in random matrix theory, when you write down these sort of expressions like this expression in the, um, uh, this exponential, this can be thought of as sort of a, a Bayesian model. And I, I can, this is described in Bouchard's book, but it's, it's sort of like this. And the idea is that when you take this limit, you, you basically say, I can express the error in a neural network in terms of some, basically a sum over what are essentially ends up being the self energy at each eigenvalue. And we think that when this is Gaussian, when you have an infinitely wide network, you end up with a Gauss, that this ends up just being Gaussian. And so you can write down an expression in our theory, which would, re which would reproduce this sort of these simplistic models, which are these, yeah, I, I don't believe in these infinitely wide networks and things like that. I don't, I don't think they're good models because I think they're in the wrong limit, but that's sort of like a half, it's a very half-baked answer to what you're saying, but we, we think we have a theory which we can reconstruct that, uh, what they're doing. And I think we can show that what they're doing is probably in the wrong limit. So you end up with sort of uh, large matrices that all end up looking like they're Gaussian and they just would give you the wrong behavior. You know, the, 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 um, the, the, the basic idea is that, I mean, if you really think about it, when we, when we think about, and this is an essence to what they're doing with the Bayesian kernels is that, and, and these models is that um, a lot of the guys who model these systems think of the weight matrices as being random, the random matrices. And my argument would be, they cannot possibly be maximum entropy. And you know, usually when you think of a random matrix, they give an object with its maximum entropy. And it just cannot possibly be, that cannot possibly be the correct model for these systems because they're not maximum entropy. They're, they're, you're minimizing the entropy. You, 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 just like in protein folding, you minimize the entropy, the entropy collapses during training. Um, so I just don't think that these kinds of models, whenever you have a, a, a random matrix model and you're assuming maximal entropy, I, I think it's difficult to extract realistic information from that. I think it can give you spurious results, but we are trying to work it out. So that's sort of my soapbox answer to that question. Not a real answer, but just sort of what my thoughts are on it today. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Uh, it's 7 p.m. here, so it's one hour. Okay. I think we can close here. I want to thank you again for the great presentation and also for the discussion after. It was really insightful, uh, at least for me. I think for the others too. And uh, we're going to post the video on YouTube and write a short blog post. Uh, I'm going to send you the link by email if you want to share them with other people. Later. I think that's fantastic. Thanks a lot again, and uh, have a nice day. Hey, thank you. These are really great, very detailed questions, and I, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen and ask. Thanks. Have bye a bye. great day. All right. Thanks goodbye. a lot. Thank you. Yeah.